Being out for over 5 years, you can find a lot of information about Breath of the Wild's combat, between how damage is calculated, player health, enemy scaling, and so on. All stuff we've covered here before, but nothing we've broke down is quite like one specific group of enemies that have been given the dim spotlight, the Blights, Water, Wind, Thunder, and Fire. They act as four separate spokes to Calamity Ganon, and this synergy happens to connect them way beyond just its thematic level, because after some strenuous research into them, I was able to break down and find out lots of secrets about them, between the hidden scaling system they all utilize, how the game handles reflection and parry-centered attacks against them, and even their specific resistances and weaknesses in combat. The goal of this video is to highlight the stats behind everything a Blight could do to you in battle, and everything the player can do back to them, along with anything of interest in between, so hopefully you can use these skills and knowledge best in your fights against them. This will all eventually bleed into Calamity Ganon as well, so without further delay, let's get right into the stats. To start with, let's talk about the health values of the Blights, or rather, their health scaling. When a player goes to fight their first Blight Ganon, regardless of which one you pick, the Blights will have 800 health to hit through, but this only applies to this first Blight, as when you eventually fight your second, its health will instead be at 1200, fight your third and it will be at 1600, and fight your fourth and it will be at 2000. The pattern here is that every Blight that you fight has 400 more health than the last one you fought, hence the health scaling system. Since the bosses in this game can be fought in any order, this mechanic adds progressive difficulty to match the stronger weapons you'll likely have later on. The main exception to this being the Blights fought at the Sanctum before Ganon, as these are all scaled to the final Divine Beast level of 2000 health by default, so it's technically easier to fight them before on the beasts themselves. To some, this is a surprise, but if you've been following the challenge runs or even just stats info, this has been pretty well applied knowledge for a while. But what most do not know is that the scaling system isn't just for a Blight's health, as it also applies to the Blight's damage output as well. Let's take Wind Blight for an example, whose wind based attacks between the tornado and the charged wind shot deal 24 damage to the player, or 6 hearts. Reminder that 1 damage equals 1 quarter heart, therefore 4 damage equals 1 heart. So this 24 damage is the value you'll experience if you fight Wind Blight as your first Divine Beast Blight, but in subsequent beasts, this attack will scale by plus 2 damage every time. So if fought as the second, the same attack will deal 26 damage, 3rd, 28 damage, and 4th or Sanctum Beast, 30 damage per hit, or 7.5 hearts. It's not just these wind attacks though, of course. Most of the other attacks also either scale or have some sort of unique property to them that'll be interesting to go over. Wind Blight's other main attack, his gun, deals 16 damage, or 4 hearts to the player, and is special because it can be reflected using the parry move. When pulled off, this value is reflected by either doubling or tripling its value, in this case 32 or 48 damage right back at the Blight. The double applies to a body shot, and the triple applies if his shot hits his eyeball weak point. A player's positioning is what mostly determines where the shot will land. Despite doing more damage though, a headshot reflection does stop his laser attack, so a skilled parrier may try to position himself to the left to parry 4 potential body shots for the max possible total damage as the gun gets in the way of his eye. But this attack can again be increased by the damage scaling of plus 2 per Blight, meaning that if Windblight is your fourth one or fought at the Sanctum, these beams will deal 22 damage and can be reflected for either 44 or 66, which helps these reflections still feel viable in the later game. Windblight also has this crazy Gunstorm attack which hits the player for 20 damage and also scales 2 per Blight, but he always teleports away as the shots hit you, so reflection data cannot be tested. What's neat about this all so far is that the systems we just covered, between the Blight health scaling, damage scaling, and reflections, is unique and unconventional to most other base enemies in the game. But there's one other convention the Blights also break that relates to the player's armor. We mentioned before that a player's armor works by subtracting its rating from an enemy's attack damage to create a final damage. So 10 armor against a 24 damage attack creates a 14 damage attack, or 3.5 hearts. But if the armor meets or exceeds the amount of an enemy attack, it still does a quarter of a heart or one damage to the player regardless. This margin of unblockable damage is what I call an armor threshold, and although it works this way for pretty much all other enemy attacks in the game, the majority of all blight attacks have the armor threshold raised to a full heart instead of just a quarter. So even with amazing armor on, they will still wall up a full heart from you at the very least. As we go through the other attacks, this full heart armor threshold will be the assumed one for all physical attacks unless otherwise specified, but it's most important to understand for the next beast, Water Blight. 
Its base attacks consist of swinging around or stabbing you with its spear, which deals 24 damage to the player, just like Windblight's main wind attacks. If you get too close to it though, it will do a defensive slam down, which deals a lighter 16 damage, unflurryable but a much easier parry. All of these attacks scale 2 damage per Blights, and of course have the standard armor threshold of 1 heart. But what if Blight's other two main attacks, which are both projectile based, the Spear Throw and the Ice Cube Hurl, have a property unique to any other attack a Blight can do, and grant them the title Armor Breakers. Both of these attacks deal 24 damage to the player at its base, and they damage scale 2 per Blight just like the others, but are unique as the armor threshold of 1 heart the attacks have also scale by an additional half a heart per Blight. So a final form Water Blight will hit you for at minimum 2.5 hearts regardless of good armor. The only odd exception to this is Sanctum Water Blight, where specifically the Ice Cubes add another heart to the threshold compared to a 4th Divine Beast one, probably because it's easier to dodge here. Now this won't be apparent when fighting him as your first beast, as the armor threshold is at its base and hasn't scaled, but this threshold increase is a unique quality only Water Blight has. It's likely its addition was to greater increase the risk of getting hit by them, as if successfully countered, both can be reflected back at the boss for really good damage. For the spear, one good shield parry will quadruple the damage outputs of it back at the blight, so a potential 24 damage hit to you becomes a 96 damage attack to the blight. And with max scaling, this now 30 damage attack will be increased to 120, one of the biggest blight reflections you can do. The Ice Cube Reflection isn't as significant, but definitely a lot easier to pull off with lower risk. If you stasis the first one in a combo, you can have all the subsequent cubes hit it for a momentum increase, then just swing once in Water Blight's direction to redirect the path back, and this impact alone does 50 damage. But more often than not, this hits him twice for 100 total. Since his projectile is not of standard ancient energy, it doesn't get reflected for a multiplied value of what it does to you, like the spear and gun from earlier, so some of these just abide by a pattern of their own. Everything we have now talked about just covered standard, physical attacks, but so far nothing about elemental attacks, which are key fighting elements for the other two blights. Elemental properties do not get blocked with armor points, but rather the respective buff, either shock resistance or fireproof. So let's go over the blights that deal with these, starting with Thunderblight. His rapid sword flurries and swipes will damage the player for the standard 24 hit points, which scales 2 per blight, but occasionally he'll throw shock orbs at the player that also do 24 damage and scale 2 per blight, but cannot be blocked with any armor points as it's an electrical attack. This instead is only dampened by the shock resistance buff, level 1 knocking a third off its damage, level 2 knocking two thirds, and level 3 completely nullifying it and contact does nothing. Same with the other shock based attacks in the game. Later in the fight, Thunderblight will imbue his swords with sparks, combining the physical and elemental properties into one attack combo. If he swings at you like this, the sword's 24 damage and the shock's 12 damage will combine to 36 and that is the value of the attack. This can be better illustrated when it uses its shield bash against you, as first the 12 shock damage stuns the player, then the sword swipes for 24 hit points. This 24 damage sword swipe scales in damage to per blight, but the shock effect of the weapon does not scale at all, as it's considered a passive effect of the boss rather than a direct attack that would normally scale like the electric orbs it throws. Thunderblight takes advantage of its shock sword the most when he rapidly flurries at the player, and since they are stunned from the shock of the first swing, they get hit a second additional time from the physical damage. Luckily though, the swings in this attack output slightly less damage at 20, which scales 2 per blight, maxing at 26. But even with the slight damage reduction, it's still one of his strongest attacks, as the 226 swings and the 12 shock damage adds to 64 damage in total when max scaled. The reason why the lightning portion of the damage only applies once despite hitting you two times is that elemental damage in this game only applies to the player or enemy is currently not experiencing that elemental effect, as we've explained in previous stats videos as well. But before a player even gets to this shocking part in the fight, he will have to face off with Thunderblight's Thunder Spear attack, which boasts a punishing 36 damage, 24 being physical damage and 12 electrical, but the parameters for this are slightly different. For one, nothing in this attack scales with Beast Completion, which is the first attack so far where the physical component does not scale in damage. And also, the armor threshold for the physical portion instead of 1 heart is 3 hearts. Luckily, this attack can and pretty much needs to be reflected, which does a fixed 200 damage to Thunderblight. This makes it insanely overpowered if you fight him as your first Blight, as this would then off exactly a quarter of his total 800 health. 
The final Blight needed to discuss is Fire Blight, whose main difference right off the bat is him being the heaviest hitter. Instead of dealing the standard 24 damage, his giant axe chops the player down for 28, which scales 2 per Blight. This applies to any type of swing, including when his axe is imbued with flames later on, as surprisingly this does not add additional fire damage as one may think. Instead, after he swings his fire axe, this spreads a bunch of stray flames around that upon direct player contact, damage them for 16 health, which doesn't scale and is completely nullified with the fireproof set bonus on the flamebreaker armor, as it is a fire attack. Some of the edges of the fire can be scraped for side bonus damage, usually 4 or 6, which also doesn't scale akin to the other fires in the overworld. The one fire attack that will scale though is the one Fire Blight directly throws at you, the Fire Cluster, as similarly to Thunder Blight's Shock Orb Cluster, deals 12 fire damage and scales 2 per Blight, nullified with the right buff. This all leads us to Fire Blight's most defined attack, the Giant Fireball, which is not only his midway special attack, but one he can repeat through later phases in the fight as well, and this one definitely has the most layers out of any Blight attack. Its explosion deals a mere 14 damage to the player, 8 being physical and 6 being fire, and this physical damage can be increased 2 per Blight. However, this is only referencing to the blast itself, as if he gets struck by the impact of the ball, an additional 16 contact damage gets applied, which does not scale in damage and can all be blocked with armor, as it's just added to the existing physical damage. The odds of getting hit by this attack though are slim to none, as it can easily be shot down with an arrow or disintegrated with ice, or even parried back at him. Doing so during that mid-phase move does a fixed 18 damage, which is 10 plus the base physical damage of 8, regardless of where the Blight is scaled, so sadly it's really weak and not exactly worth doing. However, after this phase, Fire Blight now occasionally uses his attack without his giant shield around him, which allows you to reflect not only the explosion properly, but the ball's contact damage with additional parry bonuses. And here's how it all works. The physical damage of the attack, plus a reflection bonus of 10, plus the ball's contact damage of 16, plus its reflection bonus of 10, which equals the final number. At first beast will be 44, and at final will be 50. So it's still not a super good reflection, but still free damage nonetheless. With all these different attacks between the Blights, it would be a shame to gloss over the one attack that they all share in common, which is their Charged Laser, a special 46 damage beam attack that they start pulling out later in the second phase of their fights. 40 of that damage being physical and scaling 2 per Blight, and the other 6 being purely fire. And there is a much bigger 3 heart armor threshold on the attack. Sometimes the Sanctum Beams do a little bit less so, and I'm not quite sure why. So this is probably the most familiar attack to parry in the game, being nearly identical to the feel of a Guardian Laser, and it's effective to use against all the Blights. Against Thunder Blight, parrying this back breaks the shield and leaves them open for a bit, which in itself is practical for getting a few open hits. But what you may not have noticed is that afterwards, he reshocks his sword before growing a shield back meaning that you won't have to deal with an electric shield for the next bit of the battle, making that game-ending shield bash move he does almost always not a problem. For the other blights though, deflecting the laser against them is a lot more direct, as the physical damage of the beam gets reflected perfectly back as damage to them. At its base it'll deal 40, and at max scaling it'll deal 46. If you notice, the only damage that is being reflected back to the blights is the physical portion as the fire damage from both the laser and even the giant fireball from earlier are totally ignored in this. This is because, like other bosses in the game, elemental damage is completely ignored for them, so there's no sense in wasting fire, ice, or electric properties on the blights. This is why an elemental only run of Breath of the Wild won't be very fun, sorry. Which leads us to two other little important things about the blights, their resistances and vulnerabilities, such as bombs. They are commonly thought of win-all solution when dealing with complicated problems in the game, but are nerfed in many ways when facing the blights. Due to their elemental resistance, the fire and burning damage that bomb arrows provide are completely null against them, and only the explosion damage counts, which is typically 40 fixed damage. But all Blights and Ganon have a hidden bomb resistance stat of 0.8, meaning that all bombs will only do 80% of their full damage to them. This brings the 40 damage down to 32, which still makes them effective, but takes a slight edge off them intentionally. Same goes with the remote bombs. A regular one that does 12 damage usually now does 9 against them, and an upgraded one that's normally 24 is merely 19 against them. But hey, I guess it technically makes using the upgraded bombs specifically in the Fireblight Midway just one damage point more effective than the Fireball Parry, which deals 18. Maybe that one damage point difference was intentional, or just a funny coincidence. 
For more on explosions, feel free to check out our explosion stats video that covers the majority of the others in the game. I'll have that linked above and below. One final note about resistances though. Due to the different nature on how you fight the blights in the game, it's easiest to use your bow and arrows to beat down wind blight and arguably water blight cannon as well. So for balancing, the headshot hitbox of these two blights is nerfed, so your shots only deal 50% extra damage when fired here, compared to normal enemies where it's normally worth double. The other blights in Ganon don't have this reduced at all though, as the eye is much harder to hit here. This actually does help explain one interaction from earlier though, how parrying a gunshot at Windblight's eye instead of his body does 50% more damage instead of doubling. And now you know why. I think it's all pretty neat how it connects like this. But with all these resistances comes a weakness. One major one, and that is the Ganon's Ancient Backbone. We've explained before that all ancient weapons deal an additional 50% damage to ancient type enemies such as Guardians, and this bonus surprisingly counts towards the Blights and Ganon as well. By far the best use for this may be with the Ancient Bow, which deals 44 base damage, but with the vast amount of buffs that are stackable, we can build a super powered Ganon Sling weapon. By using this with a level 3 attack buff, which adds 50% more damage, Ancient Proficiency, which adds 80%, and making sure this hits him in the eye, which adds either 50% or double the value. All these multipliers stack up multiplicatively to create either a 266 or a 356 damage shot, enough to nearly or fully 3 shot an entry level Blight Ganon. But let's just get a little crazier with this, just by changing our arrow to an ancient arrow. Typically how these guys work, I've found to realize, is that they just increase the base attack of the shot by 20 damage to any boss, which is increased to 30 against an ancient type, and is affected separately by the attack up buff. It may not seem like it would make a huge jump, but since most of the other values are calculated afterwards in the order of operations, this multiplicatively stacks to create an insane shot of 693, or 513 this time enough to either 3 or 4 shots a fully scaled Blight, or even 12 shot a no Divine Beast Strain Calamity Ganon. Which yeah right, this leaves us with one of the two final things left to discuss, the Big Pig himself. 8000 HP at base, 4000 after clearing the 4 Divine Beasts. He definitely has the most moves out of any of them, which loosely follow the attacks the Blights use, the main difference being that they each deal much bigger 40 damage to the player. This includes any of his melee weapons, whether big or small, his wind blasts, Ice cubes, slam down, if I don't mention it, assume it does 40 damage. Biggest difference here though, is that basically all of his moves, unlike the Blights, boast an armor threshold of 2 hearts instead of 1, so a lot more armor ripping than his smaller ancillaries. The giant fireball attack deals 46 damage, 32 of that being just the contact, and those slender pillars do 40 base damage and 12 shock on top of it, so that part is similar. Surprisingly though, the fire left behind by Ganon's giant axe only deals 2 hearts instead of the 4 upon touch, which is the only attack that he does that is less than the blights, although indirect. The gun cannon does a slightly lower 36 damage, 4 less than other major attacks, and lastly, the guardian beams can still reflect that of the blights, just at their base scaling. Now the damage is obviously a lot meatier, but the interesting part here is how all the reflections work for all these that can be, as compared to the Blight counterparts, are drastically buffed to make a much bigger impact. For instance, the Ice Cube attack that once hit for 50 back now hits for 100, and this typically double hits just as it did for Water Blight. The Spear Throw can also be reflect back for the same exact damage as a Max Blight, 120. But for this time, instead of quadrupling, it triples its 40 damage version to get the same effect. The gun's reflection actually works nearly the same to Wind Blights here, as the body shot doubles the damage to 72. But this shot cannot hit the head for bonus damage, and one direct hit is enough to end his combo. The Guardian Beam gets a very big buff here, as instead of just mirroring the damage back evenly for 40, it instead gets tripled against him for 120. But none of these reflected attacks can even compare to the final of the bunch which gets the biggest glow up, the giant fireball. It used to be weak, but one good parry of this sets Ganon back a whole 160 health, 120 of that being the explosion, and 40 of that being the impact damage, that you can actually observe getting applied to his health a split second before the rest goes off. Between all these reflected attacks, this is why I like to think of the Blights being the tutorial of sorts for practicing how to counter all these different moves, as most of them are far stronger offenses to use against the big Ganon in that fight. So truly, the better you're prepared and the more you practice them against the Blights, the better off you'll be. Now with everything discussed about Blights and Ganon in the base game, your final question may be, what about Master Mode? Beyond just health regeneration, are these fights any harder? And the answer is yes, by just one sole factor, 
all the Blights and Ganon get one more edge in this mode that makes them more unique than any other enemy, which is a 50% damage up on increase to the player. So when naked, a 40 damage swipe to you will now deal 60. A full row of hearts. Ouch. But the way it's calculated is very interesting, as instead of just increasing the raw damage of the attack, this value is applied at the end of the player health loss calculation, which factors in armor beforehand. So against this 40 HP swipe, if we're wearing 20 points of armor, this attack gets brought down to 20, and then the master mode increase of 50% raises it to 30. This is to ensure that your armor marginally and secretly scales with the increased damage of the master mode bosses. So having an armor rating that near meets the base value of these attacks will still put you at a similar advantage as in normal mode, with the exception of the armor threshold also scaling by 50% since it's calculated in beforehand. So Ganon's is now 3 hearts instead of 2, and the Blights are now 1.5 instead of 1. Just gotta watch out for those lasers now, as their armor threshold moves from 3 to 4.5 hearts on top of the fire damage. But in short, these master mode changes mainly punish the unequipped more, otherwise they make these fights either marginally harder or just a bit more compared to the normal bosses with enough health and armor points. And with that, that's pretty much everything I have to discuss about the stats and secrets behind Blights in the game. This was quite the extensive research project to do. You know, it really sucks that Blights don't have numerical health meters like you can get with the champion tunic on normal enemies, because that would have made all this testing, especially for the reflection data, a lot easier. My workaround was by counting all trackable weapon attacks plus one unknown against the Blight's total health to figure out what the unknown damage could be, and you know, maybe one day I just gotta do a behind the scenes on how I make these things. But anyways, if you like the things we covered in this video, a few other good ones to follow up on in the series would be the explosion stat one we mentioned earlier, the player health and armor video, and even the damage stat one. All good watches that are in the same ballpark as this. Or really, feel free to check all of them out just for knowledge's sake. They're all in the description playlist. Thanks for watching though, please feel free to leave a like and sub if you haven't already for more Stats of the Wild, and I'll see you guys all in the next one. Goodbye!